you guys in the chat uh, and to everyone who's watching the stream, g'day. Uh, okay with being streamed. At the end of the day, there's just a debate. It's just for fun. And any views expressed here are solely in the uh, pursuing of winning a debate and do not necessarily reflect the real world, but still happy to be streamed. So let's get underway. I want to run a case that they're conservative and should go to jail for that reason alone, but Udo wouldn't let me. So instead, what we're going to say is that Morales was democratically and fairly elected in a fair process, and he was forced out by the military using threats of violence, and in cases, actual violence and murdering civilians to force him to resign. It was illegitimate, it was wrong, and we ought to prosecute those responsible for it. And we were in a position to do so because of the overwhelming support of the Bolivian people who re-elected us at the next election. Some key things in set up today. The first thing we'd uh, say is we'd have to take a full investigation of what a occurred in the coup, we would seek to find out who was responsible and who engaged in those acts, and we would seek to prosecute them uh, and, and follow through all the, the legal processes. We're happy to make this as fully independent as possible, have independent observers from the coalition of like uh, American states or from other overseas bodies to make sure it is all legitimate and, and above board, and we would seek not to politically interfere with that, and this is what we would be looking to do. All right, so a couple of arguments today, but the first big thing I want to look at is the context of what happened around this coup and why uh, and what went on. Because I think there's a lot of important context to cover here. The first thing to look at is who is Morales. Morales is an indigenous person in Bolivia. Importantly, they implemented a number of socialist policies, which were particularly good in advancing the causes of people within Bolivia. And they're, they're, as part of that, were obviously quite redistributive. And importantly, they took a lot of power away from white people and from mestizo groups within Bolivia, and instead gave them back to indigenous groups, to poor people who had before been ripped away from that and had, been, had that taken away from them. Secondly, he engaged in significant acts of poverty reduction. Thirdly, he also denied access to, uh, to the, I'm going to say Lithuanian, but I mean lithium uh, st uh, stocks uh, and, and, and resources that Bolivia has from the USA, which obviously pissed off the USA significantly and led them to being involved in this as well. The fourth thing that I want to talk about in context is what happened with this coup. So obviously he was pushed out by the military and was replaced by Janine Izez, who was the head of the Senate. This person was not the leader of the Conservative Party, but was conservatively aligned, and that meant a couple of important things. Firstly, what they did was implement a number of anti-Indigenous actions and words. They called them satanic, they called them savage, and they treated them awfully, which is a massive backslide for Bolivia. But secondly, and I think more, more, more pertinent to what was going on here, they gave immunity to all the military that was involved in the slaughtering of civilians as a part of this coup, again, showing how uh, wrong they were, and again, I think, breaching a number of important laws. What happened with all that, though, was then they were forced Morales to step down. The police and the military were turned against the state and against the democratic will of the people. There was threats of violence and actual violence that resulted in that coup. But what happened next is important. At the election, Morales was re-elected in 2020. The, the voice of the people showed that what had occurred was illegitimate and against their will, and people ought to be prosecuted for those acts that they undertook. The, now, I will note here the opposition... The, not, the, the opposition, they might claim that, but the opposition in Bolivia claimed that there was voter fraud, but there was actually no evidence to support this. It seemed like they were just taking one uh, playbook from the Northern Conservative Parliament in Trump by claiming fraud, but there was no evidence to actually support this. So that's what went on. I think that provides a pretty clear imperative at the moment to already start um, uh, this prosecution process. Before we go to my next point, I'll take that POI from OO. You know, majority of people in 2016 voted that Morales should never run for president again, and he ignored the referendum and ran anyway. It ran anyway, but then won that election and then also won the election in 2020. So maybe people's minds changed, but I think there is a strong democratic will to support the individual. But even still, there are other democratic routes that you can take to adjust, to, to account for that, even if you do say you shouldn't have done that, rather than engaging in a violent military coup that slaughtered civilians. Why then is it principally important that we prosecute uh, in this case? The first thing we'd say is there's an obligation to do this because they engaged in the, the opposition engaged in the persecution of the MAS political party, of its supporters and of civilians. So we ought to just pursue justice and, and rep reparations for those individuals. But secondly, Janine Azez Hanez held off elections for a long time to control and garner that power. So again, to be held accountable for that. But thirdly, I think we also need to, to, to look at the attempts that they had to, to, um, to, to subjugate democracy. And I think it's principally important that we uphold the tenets of democracy and not allow things like the uh, claims of untrue voter fraud or the use of violence and threats to put down civilians and their actions go unpunished 
or are, are, are held unaccountable for. And I think all that is important then because that means a couple of things. It means we get that proper investigation and it means we can hold individuals to account for the crimes they have committed and the atrocities they have uh, taken against the state. And that is something that we ought, uh, we ought to pursue uh, at, at a principal level more, uh, at, at the first point because of the, the evil that was done and the wrongs that were done. And as I explained in our setup, we would pursue this in a way that was fair and that was independent and that was transparent to ensure we actually upheld that from our side. So that is importantly why it is principally important that we pursue the prosecution of those involved with the coup. The second thing I want to look at is why it is necessary. I think the first thing to, to, to note here is that the it would be extremely popular amongst the people in Bolivia and the supporters of Morales' party. He was voted back in explicitly with the expectation that he would do this and they would hold to account those that caused the deaths and caused the coup in the last party. So I think it is necessary that he does it to reflect the will of those voters. And that's particularly important that what voters want is carried through in this circumstance, given the context of what happened where the coup overrode their interest in the first place. I think, secondly, it needs to be done in order to deter future coups. Uh, uh, um, oh, sorry, it needs to happen rather to determine what happens next within the country, because this is a, such a poli big political roadblock and has dominated the political landscape of Bolivia for years now, which means we, before you get on to solving other problems, you need to resolve this first significant issue. The third thing I'd say is more likely to... Uh, reduce the chance of a repeat coup being prevented. That's one, because you're likely to make sure that, ensure that you are serious in engaging in this and you're not willing to lie down and let this sort of legal action happen. But secondly, you're likely to knock out the leaders of a potential coup by you know, arresting them and prosecuting for this action. And I note this doesn't knock out opposition leaders who engage in proper and peaceful democracy. It knocks out those who engage military and armed forces to take over government through non-democratic means. The outcomes here is that we begin to restore uh, democracy in Bolivia, and we begin to uh, allow Morales to return to the positive political uh, socialist platform the party had before uh, of the coup. The last thing I want to note about why it's necessary is the unique and important context in which Bolivia is uh, at the moment within South America. Fledgling democracy, there's a, there's a context of backsliding within some, within some South Amer Latin American states such as Venezuela. So in that context, it is important that Bolivia takes strong stands to store up its democracy and to ensure that it, it remains strong. And particularly in context of things like the Coalition of American States initially calling out behaviour uh, uh, from previous parties that was illegal, it needs to reaffirm strongly that it does not stand for illegal behaviour and is willing to prosecute it where it occurs in order to engage in regional cooperation and regional stability and not fall into the trap that other states are. At the end of the day, the coup was illegal. The coup did result in deaths and a usurping of democracy and those responsible ought be held accountable. We are proud to propose. Um, thank you for that speech. I'd like to invite the leader of OP. Uh, yeah, just before I start, uh, I want to check. Can everybody hear me? Yep. On opening opposition, we really don't care about whether the coup was illegal or not. We care about the consequences of what happens when you pursue this policy. I want to note two things before I get into argumentation about the uh, about this motion. Like, first of all, this idea of international bodies are going to come in, and that's our mechanism for ensuring a fair process. First of all, Morales has given a big fuck you to the United States of America and Brazil for intervening in this process. It is incredibly unclear to me why he would be like, oh yeah, why don't we get uh, external actors from the EU and the US, etc., to come in, especially when his main allies are fucking Venezuela and Cuba within, uh, within South America. And this has very important ramifications for their principle, by the way. This is a principally right thing to do because it ensures that, you know, we take care about voter consent and all of that sort of stuff. It's contingent on this being a fair process. If it's not a fair process, then the principle doesn't matter. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing I want to note is, as Hamza pointed out in his POI, it's not like, okay, fine, even if Morales' policies are good for the poor, uh, Morales is a bit of a dick in terms of trying to entrench his power uh, and, and removing term limits and so on and so forth. So it's not clear why Morales is a great actor and he should be protected at all costs. But 
let's go on to arguments. I would first of all note at the top of my speech, uh, and this is like, I'm sorry for making this argument, but it, there's going to be an opportunity cost argument over here, which is that this will obviously require lots of political capital. To res and, and by the way, you need to respond to local economic and political crises right now, which this will take critical capital away from. I talked about this in the political crisis point, but I want to note at the top of this, three pieces of training. One, there is a lot of opposition to Morales. It is not true that Morales is overwhelmingly popular. In fact, in the election that he recently won, he lost core constituencies of his in, the, uh, uh, in trying to get, get this. Who, are, who is the opposition? One, you have conservative opposition, obviously, you have the military, but you also have progressives, by the way, who are saying it's not okay for Morales to keep on being president and make this like a one-party state where he's a dictator. And then you also have trade unions and workers on the ground, people from the global poor or the Bolivian poor who he wants to protect, uh, who are against him. The second thing I want to note over here is at the point which Morales did win elections, there were mass protests that happened against him winning elections. And this is huge for two key reasons. First of all, if you do this, obviously opposition political parties, trade unions, etc., progressives are going to be targeted for them, um, you know, doing illegal acts, cooperating with the US and trying to intervene in the democratic process within Venezuela. Why is this bad then? They obviously have an interest in not being prosecuted. And obviously these people or their voters at the very least care about the, these leaders. And the first point over here is you get mass protests against the government. Why is this not good? First of all, you increase partisanship. Notice that Morales is not as popular within parliament as he was before. And right now, you need parliament on your side to get things like bailout packages to the poor, to not ensure legislation blockage at a time in which you already have political crises. All of these, by the way, become all the more likely at the point at which you start targeting opposition parties and systematically try to take away their access to power or, or their access to the ability to get into power in the future. The second thing I want to note, just in terms of the political crisis, is Rob is correct in pointing out that indigenous communities, etc., were targeted by conservative opposition. I just want you to think about the counterfactual, which is what the fuck happens to indigenous communities at the point at which you start taking out, uh, like taking people from the conservative opposition to jail. Obviously, Morales living in his fucking palace will not be affected by discrimination on the ground, but this increases the chances of rhetoric being weaponized against these kinds of vulnerable communities in the first place. Vulnerable communities, which by the way, do not have jobs to protect them right now because of the COVID crisis. Venezuela literally has 135,000 cases of COVID right now, and literally their only solution is a fucking Sputnik vaccine from from Russia, which obviously does, also doesn't work. So that's the first thing. You deepen the political crisis. Why is this a crucial point in taking down OG? Because note, OG is reliant on Morales being able to deliver all the promises, all the policies that will help the, uh, help the poor. But I have just proven through this point that Morales will not be able to do this in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, you are increasing the chances of protest such that they try to take him out once again, which obviously leads to political crisis for a longer period of time within Venezuela, even if Morales manages to keep hold of power. And the second thing I want to note is, how the fuck does the military respond? The first thing I want to note is, trivially speaking, the military has control over violence, and obviously people at the top, generals who made the decision to take out Morales, have an interest in preventing uh, the fact that they're obviously going to jail. But the second thing I want to note is, even people on the ground, there's an immense respect for superiors that you inculcate within the military, so therefore they are also likely to be like, why the fuck is my general going to jail, but also... Um, accede to the demands of the general when they say, well, we're going to the presidential palace to take him out once again. And there's very little, by the way, that Morales can do in terms of trying to block the military trying to, trying to do another coup, which is obviously a problem then, because if their idea is, well, Morales needs to be in power for all the policy, et cetera, et cetera, you get more, uh, you get another military coup, which prevents that, but also this erodes democracy, democracy even more at the point which you encourage another military coup. At this point, I'm happy to engage with anything that goes in government has. Um, if not, I'll take uh, OG. Where do you draw the line of when you think it's okay to have a coup? Because you're kind of like, it's fine in this case. So is it like what measure of public support? How do you, you know, how low does the majority have to be? How grumpy do opponents yeah, yeah. have to be before you say it's okay? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I'm like at opening up, we're fairly agnostic about whether this was illegal or not. Like the coup was bad, fine, it was bad. But the point is what, what are the kinds of repercussions? Because if one coup is bad, two coups are presumably worse, right? Um, the second thing then, freezing out relations. I also want to note, by the way, that Brazil and the US don't really like Morales right now. Um, 
Um, and all you need to do right now is foster trust and cooperation within these sorts of countries, which you already have alienated. Um, very trivially speaking, you need international cooperation to get access to medical aid, etc. Which, by the way, the West controls, the US controls, and so on. We need to get vaccines. And obviously, that process becomes more difficult. But even more specific to the context of B Bolivia, Bolivia's economy is in tatters right now. And they have an oil pipeline that's being built with Brazil. At the point at which you take out opposition politicians who were uh, singing the praises of Bolsonaro and were actually, um, like, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, also allying with him. Very explicitly. I would point out that these are the kinds of things that you will not get access to. You don't get cooperation, etc., which means that your ability to come out of economic crisis is all the more hampered, which goes back again to the, uh, to the Bolivian poor and their ability to get out of this crisis. The last thing I know is, let's assume this works. Best case scenario of government, there is no repeat coup in the future. You wipe out all these opposition, um, you know, corrupt people, etc. First of all, you are likely to systematically disable opposition because you're likely to take out the most key people within opposition, within trade unions, within the military. This is a very bad thing because it disables opposition from fairly competing in the next election and trying to get seats, right? And this is a problem then because Morales, even though he might be God for them, is not, obviously the accountability for him decreases and his ability to pass treaty policy increases. You get more uh, dip, uh, democratic backsliding in their world. For all these reasons, I'm very proud of your post. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I'd like to invite the DPM. Cool. Can everyone hear me? Yep. At opening government, we think that when you engage in a process whereby you attempt to subvert democracy, where you immunize soldiers and then send them out onto the populace and allow them to kill people in order to suppress the opponents of your regime, uh, and in order to secure power through a coup, then that is something that ought be accounted for. And it is not something that is acceptable to be agnostic to. We think that is an insufficient response to a pretty high principled burden we set up. The first thing I'm going to do in this speech is respond to the material opening opposition gives you. Then I'm going to go over this principle, and then I'll whip all of the practical benefits that Rob has provided for you in this debate. What does opening opposition say? The first thing they say is a bit of model bashing when they're like, well, the U.S. and Brazil don't really like Bolsa, uh, don't, don't like Evo Morales. So it's obviously not possible to have any international organizations or other countries involved in the process of, of this uh, you know, trial and prosecution. Luckily, more than two other countries exist in the world, and there are a large number of parties that are relatively impartial to this process. Like, I don't think a large number of European countries particularly care. They weren't trying to buy lithium from the Bolivian government. They have no real stake in this outcome. Or organizations like the UN have no particular reason to be, to be concerned or impartial in the outcome. I think that is insufficiently mechanized. Secondly, we hear that like, well, maybe Evo Morales is just a bit of a bad dude because he tried to avoid term limits. Firstly, not really relevant to the debate, right? Like the fact that Evo Morales did a bad thing doesn't mean that you shouldn't prosecute other people for bad things. But secondly, we would note that the court struck down those term limits as illegitimate in 2017, suggests that they're not really something we should be concerned about. And thirdly, as Rob provides you in an answer to that point of information, the fact that he was elected by a majority of Bolivians in each of these elections suggests that if people were concerned about the term limits, they certainly haven't chosen to express it at the ballot box. They do prefer him to any opposition candidate by a wide margin. He probably ought to be allowed to be in charge if that is the will of the country. The third thing we hear, and sort of the bulk of the argument of the op opposition is just like, maybe this is something that should be done, but if it comes at the opportunity cost of doing more important things, then it ought not be something that is done. The first thing we would say is, obviously, we think that our principle suggests that that is an insufficient response. But even if we were to accept this argument on the grounds that is given and uh, on like, you know, that we should weigh things up on a utilitarian metric, the problem with this is twofold. Firstly, we identify that this is probably something that increases rather than decreases political capital for Evo Morales. Why is that likely to be the case? 
Firstly, for the reason that the large number of people who suffered as a result of the coup will probably be disillusioned at the point in time where they do not see justice for the violence that was committed against them. If you're an indigenous person in Bolivia whose family members were killed by the military and immunized by Senator Inez, you probably will want to see Evo Morales put those people in jail or prosecute them. And at the point in time where he's like, well, you know, we could have done that, but it was like not very politically expedient. I think that is the point in time where the actual support base of Evo Morales is turned off rather than the groups of, uh, you know, like right wing and conservatives in the country who don't support him or give him any political capital to begin with. We don't really care about those people uh, and whether or not they support Evo Morales. But secondly, for the reason that what needs to occur in this country is a correction about the narrative about what exactly happened in the coup. There must be attempts made to get rid of the pervasive but incorrect narrative that Evo Morales rigged the election. The OAS report that suggested is riddled with errors. The U.S. Senate inquiry into the OAS report reveals the fact that the analysis was flawed, but that stuff must occur within Bolivia and must be disseminated. That can only be done through an impartial process that we support. When that successfully occurs, I think a vast majority of people who are in the middle of Bolivian society probably would be relatively willing to, uh, you know, provide political capital. So it's likely to on net increase political capital, which is why even on the terms of that argument, this is worth doing. Lastly, we hear like, uh, next we hear like, well, you know, maybe that he can't get a COVID bill through because it increases partisanship. Um, MAS party is a majority in both the Senate and the House. I don't think that's really a problem. Um, then we hear the military will be mad about this. I think they're already pretty mad that the guy they cooed is back in power. And critically, that is why this policy is necessary, right? Like you have to avoid another coup. Obviously, none of the things OO suggests you should do can occur at the point in time with the military kick him out again. That requires declawing the military. That means you have to prosecute the people at the top who are responsible for that coup and have them replaced with people who can carry out their civic duty and not interfere in electoral processes, which is why this policy is necessary once again. Lastly, we hear like, uh, this will piss off other countries like the US and uh, Brazil, and that means you won't get a vaccine and your trade deals will be hurt. A couple of problems with this. The first is just that it's unclear that any of those things accrue in the status quo for the reason that Hamza provides himself, which is that those people are already pissed off at you. Uh, it's unclear there is like, you know, pissing them off more really does more harm there. But secondly, we tell you that like the fact that Biden, like Trump was the main perpetrator of this narrative, but Democrats have relatively little to gain with it, suggests you probably can repair relationships with the US and they're probably relatively willing to go along with this process for the reason that, you know, they probably prefer Morales to any competitor. But lastly, Successfully engaging in this process is likely to change the narrative. That probably changes public pressure in countries like the US. It means that you're more likely to get support rather than less likely. The end of that, uh, I'll take Sierra. Yep. If I'm a Bolivian person who thinks that Morales stole the election, why on earth would a trial against the people who I see as the saviors who overthrew the stealing of the election convince me <laughs> otherwise? Uh, well, presumably because a trial conducted by or assisted by or observed by impartial parties from other countries would be something that you would believe. And therefore, if the conclusion of that process suggested that Morales had not, not stolen the election, you would then believe that. To the extent that your claims rest on a premise that people are irrationally convinced of the fact that Morales has, uh, you know, stolen the election or whatever uh, and cannot be convinced in any way, this doesn't really invite any additional harms because those people are so polarized that it's unlikely this really does anything more in the debate, but at the very least people in the middle are swayed. So where we bring you in positive material, Firstly, we say that the things that were done here were like really fucking bad and ought be accounted for and that all of the victims that, that suffered here deserve, you know, justice for that. But additionally, the country as a whole was screwed over by the subversion of the democratic process. And that is something that ought be compensated for. That means that prosecution must occur. But secondly, we tell you that just like when people do bad things, they ought be prosecuted for it. We should not allow people to be above the law because it's politically expedient. But thirdly, we explain to you that this is necessary necessary in order for Morales to re remain in power and avoid future coups to the extent that the policies he's likely to engage are positive. Things like, you know, a huge reduction in poverty rate under his previous terms, things like wealth redistribution, things like granting power to indigenous groups. Those are things that only occur on side opening government. That is why we are very proud to stand behind this policy. Thank you for that speech. Um, I'd like to invite the deputy to up. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, clear. Great.
I think it is instructive to look at the case of South Africa in 1993, because I think the choice that faces Morales is very similar to the choice that Mandela faced. It's instructive for two reasons. One, just because retributive justice is a principle doesn't mean that's the only principle in town. I've heard forgiveness is a pretty good categorical imperative to have. Second reason it's instructive is because it allows the community to move on. According to opening government, we should consistently and retributively prosecute any single powerful institution, irrespective of what the outcomes will be, perhaps a race war in South Africa, a literal coup again in, in terms of the military in Bolivia, because procedurally, that's what we want. I don't mean to sound glib here, panel, but these procedural arguments I've consistently noticed work in debate rooms. People in Bolivia who have families to feed cannot afford another coup. I can promise you that they won't buy the Kantian argument of spouse by opening government. That's the principle for you. The second thing I want to talk about is the process. How does this work exactly? And I, again, I don't mean to be the world schools debater about this, but this is a this house believes that debate. This means that their fiat is fuck all. They have to give structural reasons why Morales has the capacity and incentives to ensure that this process is fair. A person who has been literally sanctioned by the U UN Human Rights Council for taking over judicial independence. A person who has literally ignored a referendum asking him to not run again. The point of these arguments wasn't, you know, Morales is bad, we should kick him out. The point of this argument was that this means that he is likely to do this in the worst possible way. But let's assume for charity's sake, because that's a good thing, that you know he will do this in the best possible way. We argue irrespective of his corrupt incentives to take out the opposition, necessarily to investigate the military, you have to investigate the opposition. You know why that is? They ask for the military to step in. So necessarily you have to investigate the opposition. You have to sanction them. You have to prosecute them. It's impossible to disentangle the military coup from what the opposition wanted against Morales. I think that's very important to point out. The second thing I want to point out in terms of process is why is the response deterrence and not defiance? Why doesn't the most powerful institution in this country decide the doctrine of necessity is the order of the day. We're halfway through the COVID-19 pandemic. We're in the middle of an economic crisis. An elected president wants to take out another institution. We're going to put boots on the ground and take over the presidential palace. I've never heard a structural reason from opening government for why this is unlikely to be the case. The only response was people voted for him. They also fucking happened to vote for him the last time. Clearly, that doesn't work for the military. So it's very clear that the coup is going to happen all over again. But why is the process argument important? It's important because four minutes of Roth's speech and three minutes of Uday's speech are about how great Morales is. Probably is the CIA is an asshole. We all probably agree. The point is that he can't enact any of those policies if he's cooed again. That's the entire point. So if anything, we double their impacts. We co-opt them, the point at which we say you enable Morales to focus on the business of governing as opposed to the business of punishment. The third thing I want to talk about after the principle in the process is to do with what an alternative process could be. And here's where it's very important to talk about the opportunity cost argument. Their responses to this were glib. They said, you know, this doesn't really matter. It's not about outcomes. We can't be utilitarian, all of that stuff. There's two reasons why this argument is important. Firstly, as I've already shown to you, Morales did win the election closely. He has a fragile political coalition. This fragile political coalition needs to pass a COVID bill, needs to have a vaccine which is slightly better than the Russian vaccine, needs to refreeze re uh, relations with Brazil to ensure the Petrobras pipeline is built, needs to reestablish relationships with, with the United States after four years of fucking Donald Trump. None of this happens over the next six months. If you start prosecuting one of the most powerful and crucially also one of the most popular institutions in the country. Utter legislative gridlock and utter discursive gridlock, the point at which the capital is surrounded by protests. This means money doesn't get to the people who need it most. This means that help doesn't get to the people who need it most. I think those are people that we should look out for. The fourth thing I want to talk about after alternative processes is let's assume the process has perfect efficacy. There are three problems with the process. Firstly, I do think that it's valuable that Rob said that he is the first indigenous president, but he is the first indigenous president 
This means that he is likely to be insulated from the violence that these indigenous communities will now face as a backlash to everything he does against the coup. Think about the rhetoric in the streets of Bolivia, which is this indigenous person wants to take away our rights, wants to take away our beloved army institution. You're thinking of boots on the ground, extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances against the indigenous communities that they most want to protect in their world. Second bad outcome. The second thing that's going to happen is that you just allow Morales to entrench his power, right? Because the one thing that unites opening government's analysis is a belief in democracy. That's a di different debate I'll have with Rob later. But the one thing that unites them is a belief in democracy. The problem with that is that if Morales is allowed to use the remit of this, in of this investigation to systematically take out the opposition, to systematically make sure that uh, the army, unfortunately a bad institution which is still checking his excesses, doesn't, isn't a powerful player anymore, Morales basically becomes the person he was hating, right? the authoritarian. Notably, notice who his two best friends are, the people who were on the pickup truck with him as he came back into the border of Bolivia, the fucking leaders of Cuba and Venezuela. This is their worst fears confirmed, the point at which this person entrenches and isolates and increases his power within this scenario. The third thing that I want to talk about is international isolation. Before I do that, I'm going to take engagement from opening government. They're the only ones to ask me a point. Go ahead. The military is unpopular now because of the coup and because it killed people. So they can't coup again soon, which means the only chance to curb their power is now before they regain that power and coup again. Yeah, no, Rob, again, I don't mean to be impolite, but like that, 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 there's a search for nuance there, right? Because there's a difference between being popular versus unpopular. The, the military is also popular. The government is also popular. They're just supported by different people. That's exactly what I'm saying. This is going to lead to a political crisis, less things getting passed. That's a strange bichromatic way to look at the political scenario there. The third thing that I want to talk about is international isolation, which I think is important. What we point out to you here wasn't necessarily, it's just Brazil and the US. And then Uday, very validly, having looked at the Atlas, pointed out that there's other bunch of countries on the map. The problem with that argument is that the US is pretty fucking powerful. We didn't exactly mention like Togo there, right? We're talking about the most powerful country in the world, which has controls all neoliberal regimes, can pressure the European Union not to step in, all of that stuff. The reason that this is important is because their current allies, and I cannot stress this enough, are Russia, North Korea, Cuba, and Venezuela. They are fucked. They need help from the West, and they will not get help from the West unless they support, unless they stop talking about the CIA-sponsored military coup that they're now going to investigate more and more. Panel, this isolates Bolivia. This entrenches the power of a potentially authoritarian dictator. There's huge opportunity cost. It's a process that will not work. But uh, finally, the principle is also important in this debate. It just swings on our side. I'm so proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech. Uh, I'd like to invite the member of Gov. Thank you. Can I check that I'm audible? Yep. Uh, can you be a little louder? Um, can you hear me better now? Yep. This is better. Yep. A step closer to the laptop. All right. I'll be starting in three, two, one. Panel, I know Hamza sounds wise when he talks about why Bolivia is like South Africa and we should do what Nelson Mandela did, but the situations could not be more different. The reason this is not like South Africa is like in 1993, President the Clerk like voluntarily gave up apartheid because it didn't make sense to continue it even financially, right? And there was vast international support for the ANC. In Bolivia right now, neither of those things are true, right? There's still a chance of another coup happening, uh, like OO says, and there's still support for the army, right? I think this means that it's not analogous. We shouldn't look at that, and Mor Morales should prosecute, right? Two points of extension in CG. Firstly, why another coup is likely unsuccessful and why the prosecution will therefore go smoothly and nicely with reasons that are not reliant on like relative assertions of popularity like we get on both teams in top half. And secondly, why this prosecution is good for national unity and Bolivians generally going forward. One extraneous point of rebuttal on all this COVID-19 uh, COVID stuff that we get out of OO, because I really don't think that's the core of this debate. But like, even if it is, like, first, maybe wait like two, three months until Bolivia gets like their first shipment of vaccines and they can like inoculate like their elderly, right? If that is the big thing, right? But even if they can't, I really don't think it's still good for them not to do it, right? Because I think it's worse to keep the division going. Look at this this way, right? What we're trading off here is a few COVID-19 deaths versus the many more deaths you get through things like 
poverty because there's division in the country, no one's investing in it. Through things like skirmishes, because people still think that their military generals have a realistic chance of success, therefore they don't yield to government officials. I think, even if it's about COVID-19, still falls on our side. Let's move on to the first extension then, about why another coup is likely unsuccessful. Because OG tells you that the prosecution reduces the chances of another coup. But note, firstly, that's contingent on the success of the prosecution, which is not guaranteed, given that the judiciary is likely probably more conservative, given that there are old judges that are like established, right? But also, secondly, the process itself takes time, right? Between the announcement, say, tomorrow and the verdict a few months from now or a year from now, there is a lot of time to do another coup. So we need to show why that's not going to happen or why it's likely to be very unsuccessful if it does right? Three main reasons here clashing directly with OO. Firstly, know that the coup is perpetuated by senior army officers. The reason it succeeded last time is because they had the support of junior officers who are the ones who actually stormed the presidential palace, the ones who actually like maintained like order while things were being set up, right? I think they've lost the support of these officers for two reasons. Firstly, they saw that they failed last time. Morales is back. Why would they do it again when they literally stand a chance of being shot and killed? But also, secondly, I think the average junior officer is closer to the average citizen because they haven't risen through the ranks. They haven't been in the military for decades this means that they probably also support Morales like the majority of the population does, right? Second reason, I think these generals have lost U.S. support. This was critical in the first uh, coup, like with all Latin American coups. Without U.S. support, you don't really go anywhere, right? OG don't explain why Biden is unlikely to support that, so we're going to explain that now, right? Biden has two things that he wants to do. Firstly, he wants a clean break from Trump internationally and domestically. This does that by literally not supporting the same faction Trump supported and being more neutral. But also, secondly, I think Trump, uh, Biden, sorry, wants to make overtures towards the more socialist wing of the Democratic Party, people supporting AOC, etc., who see him as too right wing and don't agree with his policies because they supported other people in the primaries, right? I think letting a socialist government continue existing is literally the way to do that. So he's likely to want to do that. Third reason, though, I think everything I've just told you is like pretty much common knowledge. Like the generals in Bolivia who committed the coup can pretty much think that stuff on their own. I think they care more about their own lives and their own freedom than any of the other stuff, right? So I think it's more realistic that instead of staying and fighting and doing another coup, knowing they're unlikely to be successful, they'll flee to Brazil, to the US, to any other country, no thank in which they can flee. So they're not going to be there to do it, right? This is important for two reasons. Firstly, because it's analysis missing from OG, we plug the gap, therefore take it over them. Also note they're likely... In, in the event they don't commit a coup, which I told you why they won't, they're likely to be convicted in the end, because even if you can't prove that like they broke democracy or whatever, they it's very clearly documented that they were supported by the US, so they can be convicted of things like treason, right? But also, secondly, I think you get more stability in the country under one government, under Morales, and I'll explain why that's good in my second argument, which I'll get to now. This is why it's good for the nation, right? Because Owo is right that some people still support the opposition. Equally, many support Morales. This leads to division, right? I think that's bad. Uh, for many reasons, two main ones. Like, firstly, you know that the perpetrators of the coup are still out there, right? This means two things, right? The vocal conservative minority is unlikely to give up at the point at which I think they have some kind of realistic chance or unrealistic chance, but a chance of gaining power again, right? This means, firstly, like arguments and division, which are not nice, but not major, but in the an even greater sense, it means things like skirmishes in small areas where people think they can take over. It means things like not recognizing government officials when they come and ask you to pay tax, like things you vitally need for a nation to function. But also, secondly, it means that foreigners are uncertain about the situation in Bolivia, so you're unlikely to invest. And yeah, sure, it's not U.S. investment because Morales doesn't like that, but it's FDI from other places and other countries which are necessary for a country to develop, right? Especially a country that's rich in minerals and need to export them, right? Uh, before I move on, I'll take a PY from OO if you have one. On In his election victory speech on 21st October, Morales spent 15 minutes shitting on the CIA. His best friends are Maduro and Castro. Why on earth will the US and its neoliberal allies suddenly shift in terms of their support of Morales? Right. So I never said that Biden would support Morales. I'd say I said he'd stay out of it and be more neutral, which is very likely for the reasons I gave you that still stand, right? Second thing, though, that's bad in terms of uh, division, right? 
I think the chances of reforming Morales' more questionable policies are greater on our side. Because yes, I agree that the guy is not great, right? Term limits maybe should be enforced. I'm not an expert in the Bolivian constitution, right? But I think that at the point at which generals who are out there to get him and a minority population who's really vocal about hating him is out there, he's unlikely to do any of that stuff. Why is that? Firstly, because he can claim that the whole situation is an emergency, right? He needs to stay in power until he sorts it out. And secondly, some people reluctantly support him because he's better than the alternative, right? They're like, oh yeah, sure, he's not great probably should be replaced by someone else from his own party, but I'll support him. I'll keep voting for him because I don't want those pesky conservative generals to come back and keep slaughtering civilians, right? This means that there's less scrutiny on Morales' actions. If these generals get out of the way because they're persecuted, uh, prosecuted, sorry, and convicted, or even if they're not convicted, like this still stands, right? That you can then more easily call out Morales through democratic means, whether that is through like calling your MP, through voting him out, et cetera, through demonstrating, et cetera, et cetera, because you don't have the direct danger of the coup, like upsetting your whole life and plunging your currency into chaos, right? I think this means two things. Firstly, less division because people will accept the outcome, but even like based on COs, POI, if people not accepting the outcome, you see that your, your, your side is like unviable because people literally go to prison. So you shut up in the short term until you accept it. I think on our side, we get uh, a lot better stuff. Very proud to propose. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I'll just go to the washroom and be back in like 15 seconds, 30 seconds. Oh, Adi, me too. Thank God. Oh. Me too, for what it's worth. Uh, Adi, you're muted. Let's just call up. Yeah, two minute break, and we all just go. These are minutes. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Opening opposition has absolutely no delta, and their reputation can't let them get away without do it not doing the analysis here. Opening opposition highlights a bunch of people who are going to backlash against the uh, these trials. The people they highlight are white people who have had property stolen, trade unions, conservatives. All of these are people who already start out not liking Morales. Opening government even points this out in the deputy prime minister, and they don't respond to it. This, th their case makes almost no difference if the people who already don't like Morales like him even less now. That isn't the kind of impact that can win closing op uh, or the opposition bench this debate. What we're going to show you is how this erodes they Morales' don't respond internal to it. support, and this, the people who actually this, voted for him the first time. We're going to show you how centrist voters in, uh, in Bolivia, who could go either way, and even some of his core constituency are not going to like these trials, how this is going to ruin his chances of winning elections in the future, meaning, and, this, and as we will show you, this will also harm all other indigenous and socialist leaders in Bolivia who could do other good things like supporting indigenous rights and like economic redistribution. That will be the impact that will win us this debate. Note that we're going to take OG at their best on basically every front. We're going to assume that Morales currently has a lot of support. We're go also going to assume that the trial would be fair and wouldn't prosecute the opposition in an undemocratic way, all ways that opening opposition wasn't willing to be general. Uh, generous to them. Two points of extension. Then, firstly, how this makes um, uh, a, 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 how this makes opposition significantly grow and actually prevents him, Morales from being elected in the future. Secondly, how this actually could make it significantly possible for. Um, 
for another coup to happen. This will largely be engaging with closing government's extension. But I do have one piece of quick extraneous rebuttal to closing opposition, uh, for to closing government first, which is that they say, oh, conservatives are going to like on our side of the house try to do another coup. And this like shuts them up uh, in, in, a, uh, in a silence. But here's the thing. We don't think conservatives want another coup if they don't feel like one is necessary. Hence the fact that the conservative president, whose name I can't remember, instituted an election. That was part of the commitment she made. And she actually did follow through on it. People don't like doing coups if they don't have to, because it's risky internationally, you risk sanctions and you risk people rising up against you. The conservatives would rather just be a viable political party, which they like to some extent are. And so we think there's very little risk of this. It's not a very valuable impact that they hedge against. Okay, so let's talk about the incentives of centrists and what they want. And so I think that Morales support is based on being a more democratic and legitimate figure th um, than the uh, people coming before him and by being able to paint the coup against him as illegitimate. Why does this ruin that? This ruins that because Morales, uh, because it basically seems like another entrenchment of power. If Morales, and it seems, uh, 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 and I just want to highlight how much this is likely to dominate the Bolivian media landscape and uh, Bolivian political discussions because it is so controversial and likely to, pr uh, to implicate so many powerful people. People would be unable to talk about anything else. It looks like Morales is prioritizing entrenching his power over actually getting anything done simply because even if he does try to get things done, those things are going to get less reporting. Why does this erode the support of centrists? Because so it, it is true that um, uh, that uh, Morales did get a lot of votes this time, but note that he uh, did not get a lot of votes in the referendum to see if he should be able to uh, run for a third term. The kind of person who would vote for Morales now, but vote against him in that referendum is probably the kind of person in Bolivia who cares above all else about democracy and stability. This is the kind of non uh, person who's not especially ideological, probably centrist in their values, who identifies with some aspects of both parties, but wants Bolivia to be democratic because that is something that people tend to value highly is being able to control their government. These are the people who voted for Morales in the 2019 or the 2020 election who are unlikely to vote for him again in the future. What reasons do we hear from the opposite, from the government bench to think that this might not be the case? So OG claims that this is going to change people's minds about Morales having stolen the election in 2019. A absurd claim. If I think that he stole the election, it is going to look way, like, it is going to anger me further to see him try to prosecute the people who tried to do something about it. And note that Western influence won't help. You know, the West, that famously popular actor in Latin America who has famously supported democracy after all of the democratically elected governments they've overthrown. Yeah, I don't think that's going to make it look any more legitimate in these people's eyes. It is going to look like a coup to these people. Um, and, the, the, uh, uh, and so they also say, oh, indigenous people in Bolivia want a trial because of the way that the coup hurt them. But here's the thing. Indigenous people in Bolivia are a minority. They might want a trial, but others won't. And I also think that even people who like you and support your values um, will, uh, are just going to dislike you if you don't seem to be democratic. Again, hence why the Bolivian people voted overwhelmingly against allowing Morales to have a third term. This is something that these people clearly value. What does this mean? This means that you tar not just Morales in the future, but because he has become such a figurehead and a symbol of leadership for indigenous and socialist leaders, it, it is going to substantially harm the socialist chances of ever winning elections in Bolivia again. It will become a conservative country and all of the economic progress that OG wants, they get it for one term of, uh, of Morales being in power and then that's it, it's over. I'll take a POI from opening. Um, I'm confused. You say the majority of centrist Bolivians care about democracy, but somehow don't care about democracy being stolen by a coup and have no interest in any sort of prosecution of military leaders who killed people. They care about so they care about whichever party seems to be more democratic. They probably right. They probably do think that the coup is bad and undemocratic, but that does not mean that they will support an entrenchment of Morales's power, which is the way this will come off. I think people probably and and the media note will have an incentive to spin it this way for the sake of generating controversy, and the conservatives will definitely want to spin it this way that Morales doesn't care about like trying the people who hurt you, especially because he's trying like uh, you know the leadership and not like the individual who hurt you or anything. It's going to be fun as a power grab. That means that people won't support it. Okay, next, let's talk briefly about a coup because we think that 
opening opposition is thin on the ground with saying a coup might happen again, we're going to analyze exactly how this is more, much more likely on their side of the house because you need popular support for a coup to happen. Why? Firstly, because if the military is in power, they need order. You can't run a government if the people are constantly protesting. And cracking on, down on civilians isn't a sustainable strategy due to one, people fighting back, and two, the risk of international sanctions. But the, uh, uh, the military wants to uh, stay in power and wants to keep their cushy positions and their nice jobs. And this signals an active threat against the military because as it seems like a power grab, it also seems like Morales will do other things against the military, like slashing their budget, like firing people. What does this mean? This means that the military has an immediate threat and it has the popular support that they need for a coup to happen. This is a fundamental prerequisite to this that opening opposition didn't prove, meaning that they are far more likely to feel comfortable initiating another coup. We hear that they've lost the support of junior officers. No, they didn't. One, they didn't lose last time the coup worked. And yes, the junior officers are close to the civilians. We showed you why the civilians will support a coup. And I think Hamza's POI is right. They have not lost American support because this was not a, a prominent position among American Democrats. They don't really care very much. The State Department will keep doing it. Opposed. All right. Uh, thank you for that speech. Uh, I'd like to invite the government whip. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Great. Panel, I wanted to start off by pointing out a massive contention <clears throat> in the CO case, because in their only response to George's extension, they say, and I quote, the Conservatives don't want another coup. Firstly, that's a, that's a knife they're opening. And secondly, it's totally as asserted. But that actually contradicts the very last claim we get out of member of opposition when they say that the military is more likely to coup because this contradicts the fact that there isn't support for a coup in the first place. So given the fact they say both things are true at the same time, and I'm not sure how they can both be true, I don't think that they prove that any of their extension is actually plausible within the scope of this debate. But beyond that, I have two further pieces of rebuttal to the CO extension. The first thing they say is it's going to be bad for socialists and indigenous people to respond three responses to this i think first of all given the fact that the average individual cares more about their own quality of life than what happens to a couple of military generals i still think that if they are actually doing things to reduce the poverty of the average bolivian that's going to be cared about more and have more coverage than something like a trial because i just don't think that the average civilian really cares about this at the point at which like they have more imminent threats and they can actually improve their quality of life in different ways. But secondly, I just don't understand why people who previously have supported Morales are going to see this as an entrenchment of power because they literally acknowledge that these people disagreed with the coup and now they're going to see it as an entrenchment of power. No, I think the more likely scenario is that these people just see it as an upholding of the rule of law. And I think that if the average debater who's only spent 15 minutes learning about Bolivian politics can understand that this is simply media spin to focus on this as an entrenchment of power rather than the upholding of the rule of law. I think the average Bolivian who actually supported Morales and voted for him can also understand this and therefore I don't think their opinion of him is going to be impacted. But thirdly, I just think that to the extent that this political discourse is good and like regardless of political leaning, we think it's good that whoever's in power in Bolivia should be able to be scrutinized and criticized. We think that they are just more likely to be able to actually openly criticize Morales at the point at which the military is no longer a threat because now by their own acknowledgement if the military think that there is popular support for a coup they are likely to do so so the point at which the military has been neutralized the population is going to feel more comfortable with criticizing morales even if they support him because they don't think that a coup is going to come and like get rid of all stability within their country and therefore at that point i think you can just get better political scru scrutiny and that's probably more important than the political leanings of the leader um, and so for that reason, I think that the CEO extension is out of this debate. So why do I think that we actually beat the teams in opening half? Firstly, against OG, because first of all, there's this clash on improving the future of Bolivia. I think OG say that you'll increase the political capital of Morales through this trial, and therefore he'll be able to do more things which help the Bolivian people. I think that note, the only way they frame this as increasing political capital is with those who already have their family members killed within the coup in the first place. I think that this probably means that their impacts are relatively marginal because those with family members who've been killed are probably already supporters of Morales in the first place. Note that I think the George extension is much more impactful here because he explains why the trial is so necessary for Bolivia going forward. And we provide four reasons for this. 
The first is that you're just more likely to get things like FDI and private investment at the point at which the legal system seems to be stronger and at the point at which the military seems to be neutralized because it seems like there is less of a threat of coup in the future, which means it's just a more stable investment for for finances and therefore you're probably more likely to be able to help the economic circumstance of the average Bolivian because of this. But secondly, the very fact that there is a prosecution makes the future coup much more unlikely because like it's unlikely that a junior officer is also going to decide to do this at the point in which they recognize that they're like their leaders have been locked up for this but also they recognize that the population doesn't support a coup so again we think it's unlikely that this will occur in the future which means you've got a much longer trajectory of stability on our side of the house at the point at which this signaling effect takes place from this successful prosecution but thirdly we think that at the point at which you neutralize the military you just allow for greater scrutiny of morales which is probably just good for bolivia going forward whereas when you are constantly afraid that your military is going to do another queue you probably can't ever scrutinize your own government which means that government is not going to be as rece receptive to the demands of the average bolivian as it would be on the other side of the house and therefore again i think we get a better trajectory for bolivian moving forward when people feel like they can criticize morales without worrying about like another conflict but finally i think the fact that like these individuals are either likely to have fled the country or at least have shut up once they're prosecuted is probably just more able to get on with the job but the second th reason why we be OG is prince is principally because they say that it principally it's really important to get justice. But I think ultimately the principle of justice is always subordinate to the right to life, and therefore to the extent that we prove that a coup is not going to be successful, and therefore we safeguard the right to life, I think this is more important than safeguarding any principle of justice. So to the extent that we explain why the right to life of the average Bolivian isn't going to be harmed, because it's not going to be a coup for three three reasons. Firstly, because junior officers don't support what the like leading officers are doing because they recognize that it's really unpopular and then they might get prosecuted in the future which means there's no support for the leading military generals secondly because biden's not going to actively oppose this because it's a really easy way for him to placate the socialist wing of the democrats and thirdly because the generals are just more likely to safeguard their own resources the point at which one coup has already failed so they're just much more likely to flee to brazil or the u.s know that this is something which is probably like likely to happen at the point at which like brazil's already extended open arms to these generals so at that point, I think we safeguard the average Bolivian's right to life and beat them on the principle. So finally, why do I think that we beat OO in this debate? First of all, because they say that the army is going to coup again. Note that this directly clashes with George extensions. I think because of the reasons I've just outlined, I think we prove why it's just unlikely that this coup actually happens because the US isn't going to actively support them. And note that the military is never going to be able to do this without active support. I'll take a POI from opening if they have one. CEO mentioned arguments on opportunity cost and Thornton re-entrenchment together to make a Frankenstein EPL extension. The only thing that we're asking you to engage with is simple. Doesn't this lead to taking out all political oxygen away from actually helping Bolivian people during COVID? Okay. Here's, so first of all, I find you weigh on your bet, win on your bench. But here is why I don't think logically they are going to obstruct the COVID stuff. Because logically, if by your own framing, Bolivians are as poor as you say and are as vulnerable as you say, then I think it would be so fucking unpopular for the Conservatives to actually block these COVID bills. And therefore, they would never get elected in the future because the Bolivian people would be so harmed by the fact they've blocked these relief bills. That would literally be political suicide. And so there's no reason why the Conservatives are going to block these COVID relief bills. And therefore, at that point, I think there's no logical reason why even if you disagree with what Morales is doing as the Conservatives you actually decide to block these Covid relief bills but secondly in relation to the political isolation point that comes out of OO I think that given the fact that on either side of the house Morales is going to choose Cuba and Russia over the US and other countries I'm not sure why all of their harms about political isolation are not symmetric because on either side of the house they are going to choose to ally with Russia and Cuba over the US I don't think this makes any difference at the point at which like that is still their preferred trading partner and Russia will probably ensure that like Bolivia isn't going to be trading much more with the US. So I think that's utterly symmetric. So therefore, I think we prove why this coup is not likely to occur, but also why it's going to be better for the trajectory of Bolivia and therefore take OR to this debate and also win this debate as a whole. So proud to propose. Um, thank you for that speech. Uh, to end the debate, uh, up whip. Okay, uh, POIs in the chat, please. I'm just gonna check that I'm audible because I just switched microphones, is this okay? Yep. All right, awesome. Starting in three, two, one. 
I think my job is fairly easy here because Gwen has clearly won on every team's framing. If we care about effective, protective policy, democratic governments, and not having a military coup, I think in terms of the mechanism of these things being achievable, Gwen is the only person in this debate that has proven that to you. I'm going to go team by team, explain this out a little more. CG, OG, and then finally OO, why we probably didn't EPL extend to them. CG, I think in your rebuttal to what Gwen has given you, you mischaracterized what was said. Uh, Gwen did not contradict herself. What she told you explicitly was that the conservatives don't want a coup if they can be a viable political party. What happens then when um, Morales takes this route uh, is that on optics, the conservatives do not view themselves as being able to be democratically recognized. They don't view themselves as having a path to have political legitimacy that their government will see as true. That is the case where they are likely to support a coup. It wasn't a contradiction from our OO. I think what happens in their case broadly from CG is they get caught up on what the DLO flagged, saying that they need to flu uh, prove feasibility. The broad thing that they try to prove to, that they try to prove to you uh, is that another coup won't happen and they want to stop that. I I think what's awesome about Gwen's case is that she can completely concede that this would be an effective thing to do and all of our impacts still stand because the popular support that Morales had on re-election was really important. What that meant was signaling for a true democracy and contentment for citizens. I think the, the fundamental issue in this debate is that even if Morales uh, did win his original election like uh, legitimately, there's a large uh, belief that he did not, that the, that the 2019 election was stolen because conservatives dislike him already. I think what happens then when you do uh, try to take these people to court to prosecute them is people that are already suspicious of him double down on this even more they and they don't know they no longer see the government as the right kind of person or as the right kind of government that's going to lead them to be uh, being like legitimately democratic to having themselves recognized the best course that we can take then i, I mean the right has to concede if we can if we continue with the status quo that he is a legitimate president if they didn't like him before what happens then is that propagating the belief that he is not that he is just trying to consolidate his power because that's what the military group is going to be uh, the prosecuting the the people in the military is going to be read as, I think is going to be way, way worse because what happens then is you have citizens actively saying, we don't actually like this president anymore. That's when they're more likely to go out to support military queue. That's when they're more likely to think that it's something that they should have. Their case is actually the contradictory one. Two things I'm just going to say. The second impact they have is pretty much if you don't prosecute, then the military will keep causing problems. But their first point about how there won't be another coup while you are prosecuting is completely like contradicting that when they flag junior officials and the loss of US support. Those two things aren't actually reasons that a coup won't happen again. But if they believe they are, then like it's not a problem anyway. There is no reason to prosecute. They fall out of this debate. They have no benefits. Moving on to open government then. The thing that they broadly think that, say that they care about is securing democracy. The burden they therefore had to set for themselves and had to prove in their speech was that this makes democracy better. They didn't do that. I think fundamentally the problem that they had was that um, when people believe that Morales may have rigged the election, it becomes very, the, the, the democratic legitimacy of the government becomes far more contentious, meaning you're more likely to see the kind of backsliding that they say is bad. Um, even though it's like unknown whether or not he did, a lot, uh, just the fact that a lot of people think it is the problem. They did not win on proving that the democracy is seen something that is feasible. I think um, well, I'm going to engage broadly with the frame that they should have done around what their case actually ended up being. Um, the idea that like Morales has good policy and they want that to continue, I think Gwen wins on this. What are the reasons that they give in opening government? I think they say that um, you want to, you're going to get more political support from those who were harmed by the coup, and that means that Morales has seen some more legitimate president can continue doing the good things that we already like. First of all, those that were harmed by the coup is likely to be a small number of people. I don't know why this is the delta that means that he gets the widespread support that means that this policy is going to be passed through parliament if you want that those kind of impacts to exist. I think those individuals are probably already on your side due to anger at the military and the status quo. This isn't going to mean that they're going to support you even more. They're already there. But even if we can see that like to some extent it gets better, the centrists that Gwen talks about are people who are on the left because they care about democratic legitimacy are likely to turn against Morales at the point at which he does this. I think they'll be off put by the fact that what it looks like visibly is that he's just trying to consolidate his power when the reason he was supporting him in the first place was because they did not was because they were already angry at the military action that was not viewed as something that was democratic. I think this is actually a road to the support. We went on the numbers game for people who are going to be turned against them, meaning that the kind of policy you care about and being able to pass does not happen. The optics that Gwen explains to you about how this looks like a consolidation power, a turn against democracy, is what's most important. I think um, the US is not going to help with this prosecution, but even if we can see this, it probably makes it worse because US interference is not something that is the most popular thing in South America. I think the reasons for that should be fairly obvious. Um, yeah, the parliament is actually not likely to pass good policy at the point at which they also see their citizens. Conservatives are already, already rallying for this. Oh, you're correct. But what happens then is that people who are centrist or people who are just in the left because they care about those things are more likely to not want those his policy to be passed. This is the actual problem. But the most important thing that I think Gwen tells you is that it harms social and progressive leaders long term because it's not just about the policy that could be enacted now that's not going to, but individuals who would be running on similar things if you care about protections for indigenous rights or redistributed economic policy are always going to be in the shadow of a leader that visibly was just trying to consolidate power when people were already pushing against that. What that means then is the state that you get 
that that policy, even if they would have supported otherwise, is now going to be lost, or it's going to be way harder to convince people that's something they should watch or they should be supporting. If they are a white person who maybe would not care about indigenous rights otherwise, they're more likely to opt into believing, oh, well, it's not really important. I'll just vote for someone who's more center. That's the kind of thing that happens. This distaste is what's actually the problem long term, because policy is not just not going to be passed right now, but also it makes leaders being able to do that later is more important. The way in here is obvious. If they're not able to achieve those kind of policies, and that's the only index they were trying to give you from open government, they should fall out of this debate. Um, Yes. All right. Moving on to opening opposition, because I don't think we actually EPL extended them, but happy to talk about this later if we did. I think the problem with opening opposition is that they just highlight the fact that opposition to Morales already exists. The, the, the groups that they flag are very clearly like trade unions, are conservatives, are those that are already protesting. That's like what they say in the LO or are, are, are going to now regardless because they already don't like and this government. It already doesn't align with their politics. I think their framing here is, again, the same thing that Gwen is winning on uh, over whatever their immediate impacts are, because it harms the progressive policy that Morales is implement the harms to progressive policy that Morales could be implementing actually happen, not just when you piss off people who are already mad at you, but you piss off those who would be supporting you otherwise, but now see reasons not to as much anymore. I think the problem is that these people started, the problem with their case is that these people started out not liking Morales. Yes, they may be more upset now, but their impacts are, the impacts that happens as a result of this are symmetric. I think what Gwen actually proves to you is the true delta, that it's not just like still hard to get past progressive policy, but now there is support from the left that is being diminished, meaning even if like opening up Position wins the top half because they actually prove that these things are happening more often. Gwen tells you that they, they wins all their own framing because she just gets more of it on net, which she proves to you that the people who would be turning against are those that are needed to actually make these things be enacted through Parliament. Um, yeah, I think even if you believe conservative backlash is enough, we get more of it in the interim. We can see that like maybe they went on COVID vaccines or whatever, but the long term as well as we're going to taking this over them because it's not just about how this dislike for morales is going to affect political discourse in the immediate time after um, whatever this prosecution happens. Is that it changes the course of politics in Bolivia because short in the long term, other leaders are going to be similarly disliked because they have this the same um, tainted background of being needed to follow a leader that already was not viewed as popular, not just by people who didn't like him, people who could have liked him, but now aren't going to anyway. Very proud. Oh yeah, if their framing is getting these protections, we take it over the way back. Very proud to oppose. Uh, thank you everyone for the wonderful debate. Uh, please close, uh, close the floor, shake hands, and uh, please, uh, I mean, and you'll get the results in the Discord channel. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to request everyone who's not a judge for this round to leave the call. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thanks for judging.